and welcome to the Kingsley Napley webinar on free movement in the UK, the end of the road. We put a question mark in there just to entice you all in to join our stellar panel who will be telling us a little bit about their thoughts looking back for 47 years um, over the UK's relationship with the EU, EU free movement in the UK, and also looking forward into the future to the challenges ahead for British citizens in the EU and potentially EU citizens also in the UK. We are coming to the end of a, of a very long period where free movement has been part of our lives, part of our legal lives, and many of the lawyers uh, and academics and policy people who are joining us today will have uh, benefited from, the, from those rights, enjoyed them as individuals, as well as advising their clients uh, about these issues and writing about these issues. Um, we're rather in a bizarre state at the moment as British nationals in that we are no longer EU nationals, so we are third country nationals, but we still have this little vestigial tail of free movement that is attached to us. Um, and we, for a few more weeks, can exercise our rights with these residual rights to go and live and work anywhere in the EU. And from, from the 31st of December at 11 o'clock UK time, those rights will end. Uh, it is a very significant moment. And before I introduce the speakers, I wanted to just to share a very brief story with you. 26 years ago, when I started working with one of the panelists uh, uh, speaking today, who I'll introduce in a minute, um, I got a call from somebody at Heathrow. And uh, it, was a, it was an American national working in the Netherlands who was uh, coming in. He was a, a shamanic uh, guru who uh, would uh, hold these shamanic sessions and consultations with people who, uh, who really needed some light in their lives. And he provided workshops, uh, paid for workshops across the EU to lots of interested people. And he flew into Heathrow and told them, yes, I'm coming to work in the UK. Uh, I'm coming to do a workshop and I'm going to get paid for it. And they said, oh, well, you can't do that. We, 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 were, we were given a call. Um, I think Ted Badu, our friend at EverArts, now retired, um, asked, uh, was consulted and, and told them to call us. Uh, and I ran into Elspeth's office and said, we've got a problem, Elspeth. We've got somebody who's going to get refused entry. And Elspeth, um, as, as we did in those days, sat down and we sat around the ashtray having a quick cigarette in the attic room at 17 Queen Square. And Elspeth said, um, oh, there's a case that came out uh, just this summer called Van der Elst. And it reaffirmed something that was said by the court a few years before. Why don't you go and have a look at that? And um, uh, I did. And I sent a fax to, uh, to Heathrow. And lo and behold, uh, and uh, threatened to, um, to uh, sue for damages if they didn't let our client in. Lo and behold, our client was allowed in with no restrictions on working. And that was the power for me for the beginning of my career of free movement, the power of uh, the EU law, of free movement and uh, free movement of services and of people, um, which has been part of my career and sadly will not be part of my career very much going forward. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the speakers this morning. Um, we have a stellar panel, as I said. Um, and first up, we have uh, Sir Nicholas Blake, who many of you will know as one of our leading immigration lawyers in the UK and the writer of the leading immigration textbook. Um, Nick was appointed as a High Court judge in the Queen's Bench Division in 2007. And as many of you will know, he served as the first ever president of the newly created Immigration Asylum Chamber of the United Kingdom Upper Tribunal in 2010. and served there until 2013. Um, He's represented the Judiciary of England Wales um, in the European Association of Judges, um, has uh, a very varied and, uh, career all over the world in training uh, other judges and lawyers, and um, is really one of, our, one of our leading lights um, and certainly a great inspiration for me over my career. Um, he retired from the Judiciary in October 2017, but we're delighted to have him today. And he is, of course, a, a consultant at Matrix Chambers, one of the leading UK barristers' chambers. Um, our next speaker after Nick will be Case Grunendike, who is Emeritus, Emeritus Professor of Sociology of Law at the Radboud University Nijmegen in the Netherlands. 
and he's founder of its Center for Migration Law and a member of the Standing Committee of Experts on International Immigration, Refugee and Criminal Law, which you will probably know as the Myers Committee. Uh, he's an honorary member of the, the Odysseus Network of Experts on European Immigration and Asylum Law and an editor of the journal Asyl and Migration Recht. And our last speaker is my colleague Elspeth Kyle, who's the Jean Monnet Professor uh, at the Sonam at Queen, Univer Queen Mary University London and a partner at King's in Apley. She's also a visiting professor at the College of Europe Bruges and you will know her all as an expert in free movement but she has many other interests across the area of immigration and asylum, border control, criminal law, police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. She is also the co-editor of European Journal on Migration and Law and the co-editor of the book series Immigration and Asylum Law and Policy in Europe pub published by Martinus Nishhoff. Um, I'm sure that many of the, those joining us today will know Elspeth very well personally as the co-chair of ILPA's um, uh, uh, European subcommittee. And uh, Elspeth also has um, a long and varied career in immigration and has been an expert advisor to many institutions, including the European Parliament, the European Commission, the Council of Europe, um, um, you, the UK Parliament, in fact, and other European and international organisations. So I'm delighted to welcome them all. And I'm now going to hand over uh, to Nick Blake, uh, who is going to take us through his presentation. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, to Nick, Nick, uh, to, 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 to talk to us. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Nick, for that introduction. Uh, welcome to all of you for um, this occasion. I I'm going to spend the 15 minutes allotted to me to make some reflections on the difference between a right based upon a treaty to cross state frontiers and the position which uh, applied and will apply in the future, which is based uh, on permission of the executive pursuant to legislation passed by parliament. Um, and so uh, this period uh, of uh, free movement in the UK actually corresponds within a year to my career at the bar and then as a judge. Uh, and so some of my reflections will be based on some of the older case law. And we start with the first uh, slide. We have here the case of Schmidt. Schmidt, you may remember, was a German national who was a Scientologist who wanted to come and study Scientology in East Grinstead and he was barred from doing so by an order. He challenged that order in the High Court by way of originating a motion and he lost and he lost in the Court of Appeal. It's not the result, however, which is important. The Court of Justice later on was to say uh, Scientologists could be barred on public policy grounds, but the reasoning behind it. And here we had Lord Justice Widgery shortly before he became Lord Chief Justice um, saying, uh, uh, pick it up really the last bit of the quotation, uh, you can be, aliens can be refused entry arbitrarily. And uh, in such a situation, last sentence, the desire to be land can be rejected for good reason or bad, for sensible reason or fanciful, or for no reason at all. That was the common law of aliens applied under the aliens order to a German national very soon before we joined the common market or the European economic community as it once was. Can we have the second slide now, please? Thank you. Uh, obviously contrast that with British subjects. There's an error in my first bullet point. Of course, it's ECHR Article 2 of Protocol 4, which we still haven't ratified, giving an international right for British nationals to come to the United Kingdom, partly because we could never work out who British nationals were, see Hong Kong, British overseas citizens. But even a statutory right of entry can be subject to statutory restrictions. We've got the Commonwealth Immigrants Act where that process happened. We, of course, then have the fact that you can have to, if, you, if, if your right is given by legislation, it can be regulated by legislation and you have to present a passport 
and we all have in our minds the Windrush scandal of people who did have uh, indefeasible rights to remain, but because they couldn't prove them 40 years later, uh, effectively lost them. It's striking as well, the fourth bullet point, that even in 1989, a discussion as to whether there was a right to a passport could take place in the Court of Appeal without any reference to EU law and the obligations to facilitate uh, crossing of um, state boundaries within Europe. Uh, final one, I want to make a contrast in this presentation between the rights of the spouses of British citizens that come within community law, EU law, and uh, the position where they fail to do so, in particular the case of MM Lebanon, which worked its way up from uh, through myself, a judgment that I gave at first instance to the Court of Appeal and then to the Supreme Court. And we contrast that with what we will come to shortly, the case of Carpenter. The question I would like to pose is, um, well, why are British, national, British UK nationals' rights of entering their own country uh, less effective than uh, a British nationals' right to enter pursuant to community law. This slide then tells us some of the bullet points of how we learned about community law. In 1973, when that great day happened, um, the Home Office thought, well, all we need to do is we have immigration rules saying you'll be allowed in um, uh, and your passport will be given permission to enter. Uh, and then Pete reminded us that you can't do that because the stamp in the passport is not the source of a right, it's simply evidence that you had a treaty right. Um, then there was the great reverse discrimination case of Surinder Singh, which meant that if a British national did work abroad, in that case for Germany for something like a year, and then re-entered the UK with her non-national uh, uh, third country national spouse, she could rely upon uh, community law uh, and not the primary purpose test of national law. There's another example, which is um, simply uh, the, the last bullet point, Chen parents. It was a case which I decided as a judge, but it, it, it tells the story of a woman who was originally from the Ivory Coast, who had a child who was a French citizen, she then becomes a partner of a quite a, a wealthy commercial solicitor living in the Gulf. They then have to leave the Gulf in a hurry, but she's denied access to the United Kingdom originally because in a previous life, um, she had overstayed her leave by a few months and that prevented her from re-entry. But of course, she, her French child was entitled to come and she had derived rights. And so that's a story about treaty rights. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, I think we also learned that it's not just rights given by community legislation, the directives and the regulations which were designed to implement these rights, the treaty itself could be the source and a directly effective source of rights um, because the legislation, it turns out, were examples of principles of community law rather than the whole of the right contained within them. And I remember in particular the case, uh, one of Elspeth's cases, Baumbast and uh, Rolle, um, which decided that point in 2002. I'll leave over some of the problems which were never resolved. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Uh, here, uh, I want to highlight the case of Carpenter 2003. Now, you recall that um, colleagues in the community law world think that uh, maybe the Court of Justice was stretching a point by finding a community a connection by reason of the fact that Mr. Carpenter, a British national resident in London, as I recall, uh, had a community right by sending advertising his business in Paris. That apart, however, what's important is that he had a Filipino spouse who had a period of overstay, infringed the immigration laws of the United Kingdom by not leaving, but uh, 
she was in a genuine marriage uh, and for that seemed to be for the court of justice the important consideration can we have the next part of the quotation please on the next slide uh, and what it says at, at point five on this slide it is clear that the separation would be detrimental to their family life therefore to the conditions under which carpenter exercises a fundamental freedom it could not be fully effective if he were deterred from exercising it by obstacles raised in his country of origin to the entry and residence of his spouse quoting seeing that we've already quoted now that is just a fundamental difference from the approach in the uk if by denying your spouse entry you are deterring the uh the EU national from exercising treaty rights, why, I asked rhetorically, does the same not apply to a British citizen um, who cannot go back to their own country uh, or reside there uh, because their non-nationals or their third country national spouse uh, doesn't comply with some of the punctilious requirements of immigration law. And that's going to be a problem which uh, press reports suggests British nationals presently residing in the Union in countries with a lower standard of living than the UK uh, may not be able to return to their country of origin with their long-standing spouse because they may not together be able to meet the financial requirements. Next slide please. Um, I also then we go to the other side of the equation you have the right but something has gone wrong usually criminal behavior which means that you face expulsion we all know the concept of public policy set out in the 1964 directive but my uh, particularly uh, my favorite case on this topic is actually one based on the Ankara the Turkish Association Agreement where there was no reference to um, a legislative order spelling out in terms but, it, but by this point the principles of community law applied generally and this is the case which makes the point most strongly that it is not permissible under community law to deport someone who has committed criminal offences on the basis of deterrence of others. Uh, you see that at the paragraph 61 quoted in the last bullet point. I can tell you a story that I was trying a crime in Manchester along with Richard, Mr Justice Prender, Richard Prender as he then was, and we discussed um, this case with our uh, colleagues on the circuit bench who were all astonished because they said, well, the whole point of recommendation for deportation is to deter other aliens. It's nothing to do with the uh, dangerousness of the offender or, um, and they were right uh, as a matter of UK law, a case of Florence said that, but wholly wrong as a matter of community law. Next slide, please. Conscious that we're now becoming to the end of time. Um, I'm not going to dwell on uh, that slide. So let's go on to the next slide. I think Elspeth will deal with some of their points. And here we have the issue, which I think may be at the heart of rivaling uh, judicial interpretations. Community law is a treaty based law and therefore we look at the object and purpose of the treaty as a guide to its interpretation. But it's very unclear whether there is any object or purpose uh, of the Immigration Act and whether a purpose of construction um, is possible uh, and in indeed what the purpose is. So we are outside the field of uh, treaty based law. In, a, in, in the field where executive uh, policy goes, and as we have seen right on the first slide, what that could mean in, in, in one version of the law. Let's go to the next slide then. Uh, for lawyers, um, this is familiar. Um, it was Lord Atkin who reminded us that Humpty Dumpty was a source of interpretation of the law. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, which is to be master? That's all. I seem to recall that Humpty Dumpty uh, did not end happily and had a great fall. 
but there in this whistle stop tour of the principles of a treaty based right with its subordinate um, way instruments of construction, we seem to be going to a system of admission of aliens and all British or all non citizens, which is now based simply upon rules devised by the minister with a light uh, regulatory oversight uh, and where the case law on human rights is uh, somewhat limited in, in its effect. Can we have the last slide, please? So therefore, farewell um, uh, European uh, free movement. Uh, welcome back, it seems, Humpty Dumpty. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nick. That was, that was very enlightening and uh, slightly worrying to see rights that we've had for 47 years suddenly being extinguished and the lights being turned off. Um, but we shall see. Um, I should just say as well that uh, we're having a Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, we'll probably have hopefully 15 to 25 minutes of Q&A, uh, so please stay around. And if you have a question that you would like to pose to any of the panelists, do use the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, I will be monitoring that uh, and I will hopefully be able to field your questions at the end of the presentations. So I'm now very pleased to move on to our next speaker, Case Grodendijk, who I've introduced. And Case will be talking to us about the considerable contribution of British lawyers to EU migration law. Case, over to you. Case, you'll need to put your microphone on, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And, and it's a real pleasure to, to be in a panel with two longtime friends with whom I have been in contact and cooperated with such pleasure. Uh, before and, and after Brexit, there has been a lot of negative discourse uh, about the UK's role in the EU. Uh, and I think in that discourse generally has the, the, the positive contribution, and I mean not only the financial contribution of the UK, but the, the contribution of the UK uh, to the EU generally and to the EU law has been underestimated. And that... Uh, made me ask uh, the, the question, uh, what has that contribution been? Next slide, please. Now, the first contribution uh, by the British government was uh, uh, proposing judges to the, to the Court of Justice. And in, uh, since 1973, there have been five judges, five all men. Uh, the first uh, one and the third one were both Scottish lawyers and uh, Conrad Schliemann and Christopher Padia, both were uh, British lawyers of immigrant origin. Conrad Schliemann was born in 1937 in Berlin and survived the bombing by the RAF uh, over there and moved to uh, family in London shortly after the war. When he was appointed uh, as a judge in 2004, his colleagues at the Court of Appeal asked him, what for heaven's sake are you going to do in Luxembourg? 2004. And the last British judge at the Court of Justice, Stavar Vajja, uh, was a child of a Hungarian father and a German uh, mother. So uh, the composition of this team of judges tells us something about uh, both diversity uh, and uh, opportunities for upward social mobility in the, in the UK. Next slide, please. If we look at four, um, the uh, four UK advocates general at, at the court, then uh, on the continent, the, the name especially of Francis Jacobs is, is still known because he was the one who wrote uh, the uh, famous handbook on uh, community law. And he was the one who being the longest serving advocate general of the, of the court ever, uh, in his, many of his conclusions uh, stressed the importance of the integration of human rights uh, into, uh, into community law. Next slide, please. What, 
the, the, the special contribution, I think, uh, that the UK judges uh, brought and also the Advocate General brought to uh, the court was their experiences as practicing common lawyers. Uh, if you compare with the Dutch judges in the court, they predominantly were university professors rather than uh, practicing uh, lawyers. And uh, I'll, I'll give you three examples of, of the contributions, the, the contribution those uh, uh, common lawyers brought to the Court of Justice. Uh, until the mid 1990s, lawyers would read out their pleadings in Luxembourg and then go home. The uh, last British judge, Judge Vaja, in his farewell speech in Luxembourg said, and I quote, I recollect sad hearings from old times in Luxembourg when days of preparations and hours of pleading elicited not a single question. With the, the presence of uh, common law lawyers, and it took them some decades, decades to convince their colleagues, finally the, the bench became more active. Uh, a, a second uh, influence was the explicit references to, to uh, previous judgments, previous case law in the judgments without accepting the star and sizes uh, principle. Uh, and uh, quite recently, the influence of the Amicus Curiae. Early on in the Strasbourg court, uh, which had common law influence from the very beginning, there uh, was the, the, the practice of accepting uh, third party interventions by Amicus Curiae. Uh, for instance, the UNHCR uh, has a long tradition of acting uh, as uh, an inter intervener at Strasbourg, but in uh, the Court of Justice, uh, until very recently, this was uh, not possible. And I remember initiating together with uh, Elspeth Gauth a study for the UNHCR to explain them that the, the, the system of participation in uh, Luxembourg was qu quite different from the participation in, uh, in Strasbourg, and that they had to find out new, way, new ways to uh, let their voice know in Luxembourg with in the new asylum cases uh, after the, the Treaty uh, of Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, again, it was the influence by uh, the common lawyers who uh, opened up, I think, the, the eyes of the, the, the civil lawyers in Luxembourg uh, of the, uh, the usefulness of this instrument. Uh, and uh, I would also like to point out to uh, Vadia's play for more plea for more visibility uh, of the court hearings. Uh, uh, in his farewell speech, he compared the uh, limited number of people who can be present in the, the Grand Salle uh, in, in, in Luxembourg with the uh, uh, access via internet of the Supreme Court uh, hearings in the United Kingdom. Uh, and this influence will remain uh, after Brexit and uh, the, the two uh, recent cases uh, dealt with by the Grand Chamber in Luxembourg, both on violation of uh, the uh, independence of the judiciary in, in, in Poland, in uh, a case uh, decided in, in April, uh, the uh, uh, Court of Justice explicitly re uh, and extensively refers to letters it, it received from the Polish Ombudsman on the, the actual situation of the uh, judiciary in, 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 uh, in, in Poland, while the Polish uh, Ombudsman was not a party at all to the, um, uh, to the proceedings. Uh, and in, uh, in a recent case on the uh, uh, more recent case on the uh, European arrest warrant, the the court not only actively uh, discussed uh, with all the parties uh, present in the case, uh, but also with a lot of uh, other experts during the, the, the hearing, how to solve uh, the, uh, the 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 re the problem of the um, uh, the violation of the independence of the judiciary 
in the system of uh, uh, the European arrest world. Next slide, please. Uh, the contributions of the, the common lawyers in the court to uh, the EU more generally. I mentioned already the, the, uh, the integration of human rights and individual rights in EU law, where the, where the, the Francis Jacobs as an AG uh, had an, an, an enormous uh, influence. Uh, the whole idea of, of due process and procedural safeguards also as, as part of the principles of uh, EU law, uh, stressing that uh, procedural safeguards serve the interests of the administration uh, also, uh, since they uh, lead to better uh, the decision making. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the, the, the UK uh, participated in uh, by intervene, intervening or by presenting written observations in, in uh, preliminary references more than any other member states. And, and uh, uh, Judge Vajja says that this was the, the early experience that the, 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 the British government had in, in 73 uh, learning uh, soon after uh, a session of, about the crucial role uh, uh, of the Court of Justice uh, in development of EU law, when in this, uh, Sabina case for the first time uh, uh, it was the court held that the individual form could uh, uh, rely directly on, on the, the, the EEC treaty, the provision on equal treatment of men and women in the, in the EEC treaty, and uh, by intervening and uh, by uh, presenting written observations, uh, observations, the the, uh, the the British government indirectly contributed to the quality of the of the judgments. There was another interesting experience where you, where you see the, the the position of the British government uh, uh, differed from uh, that uh, of other governments of other member states. Uh, there was a tradition uh, in the UK uh, to instruct private uh, practitioners to represent the UK uh, rather than civil servants. Uh, the Netherlands and, 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 and in other member states, there, there, there's a few, a, a small group of uh, civil servants in the Netherlands, three or four lawyers at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who represent Netherlands in all cases. And the difference is that the, 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 the expertise with uh, EU law and with the practice of the court remains in a, in a very small group of lawyers um, uh, rather than uh, a, a wide experience as in the, in, in, in the British case. So very, very few practicing lawyers in the Netherlands will ever have a case uh, or have experience with the personal experience with the, the, the court in Luxembourg. And the, the, the British system uh, led to a distribution of, of personal experience and of knowledge uh, about the EU law and the functioning of the court uh, throughout uh, the, the bar. Next slide, please. Uh, contribution of the, the, the UK to uh, EU uh, migration law. Uh, Almost a quarter of all references by, uh, to, on the, the Free Movement uh, Directive of 2004 were made by, by UK courts, uh, and especially the, the case law in, in, in Luxembourg uh, on the right of permanent residence, on the durable and registered uh, part, uh, partners, and on the rights of uh, third country national family members of EU citizens were the result of uh, references by, by British courts. And, and here you see the, the creative UK uh, lawyers exploring the, the new elements uh, of uh, that 2004 uh, directive. Uh, this, this might be the flip side of, of restrictive UK law of the size of the immigration, uh, the free movement migration to Britain or and, and I think that this is an in, important part, the, the creative uh, immigration uh, lawyers in, in, the, in the UK. Uh, and this contribution to the case law of the Court of Justice and to EU migration law 
will uh, last long after uh, uh, the, uh, the the Brexit date. Next slide, please. The contribution to uh, EU migration and, and asylum law is uh, far smaller uh, than the, the contribution to the free movement law. Uh, partly that is due to the, 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 the partial opt out by the, uh, the UK. So there are less references by UK courts uh, or only uh, or, or mainly to in relation to the uh, uh, asylum uh, instrument. Uh, but uh, interestingly, many of the inter influential handbooks on EU migration law, also uh, on, on, on e other parts of EU law, like, like the, 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 the um, handbooks on, on the, the, the charter, the EU charter of fundamental rights, are written by uh, UK scholars uh, like Steve Pierce, like Elspeth Gard, like uh, Catherine Castello. Uh, and a last uh, interesting contribution of, of uh, the British way of lawyering is the, the, the contribution of uh, institutions, Britain, British institutions like the Air Centre and like uh, ELPA, who were models for organization of immigration lawyers uh, in, in, in several other, other member states, in, in uh, Germany, in Italy, in Spain, in the Netherlands. You see that the example of uh, this way of cooper cooperating and sharing knowledge and, and, and uh, having expertise on using uh, the, the, the two uh, uh, European uh, courts uh, was reflected uh, and, and was copied uh, and, and was uh, thankfully used. Uh, next slide, please. So far, my, my, uh, I, I pointed to a, a positive uh, uh, influences uh, that may, this may raise the question, are there no negative influences? Uh, and yes, there are, uh, and I, uh, 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 mentioned three examples uh, under the uh, 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 heading of UK lawyers, uh, tenacious negotiators. Uh, uh, and the, the first example uh, uh, is the, the uh, provision in the Racial Equality Directive of 2000 uh, that excludes differences based on nationality and migration law uh, uh, and, and also issues uh, related to uh, immigration law from the scope or, of the directive. This exception uh, was proposed by the, the UK during the, the, during the negotiations. Uh, and interestingly, while uh, as far as I know, the differences based on nationality are covered by the UK uh, national race uh, relations race religious uh, race relations legislation uh, and uh, the uh, the the exception uh, for uh, immigration law uh, in the national uh, British law was exported so the uh, the uh, was there was a rather uh, selective uh, uh, use of the uh, uh, use of the national law uh, in the in the in the um, British national law in the negotiations uh, on that directive. Second example is uh, of three years later, the 2003 uh, reception conditions. There, at the very last uh, moment, the after the uh, there was already political agreement on on that uh, uh, directive. Uh, the UK. Uh, uh, entered uh, or re what uh, reopened the, the discussion to uh, to copy a clause from uh, its national law uh, in uh, the directive uh, uh, the, stating that the uh, uh, the member states may withhold conditions uh, where asylum seekers failed to demonstrate the asylum claim was made as soon as reasonably practical. And there the interesting thing was that the High Court at that time had, had already decided that uh, that provision in the national uh, British legislation 
was in violation of uh, Article 3 of the European Convention uh, of, of Human Rights and uh, a, a, a judgment that was later confirmed by the House of Lords. And still the UK tried to, uh, and successfully tried to enter this uh, clause into the uh, directive happily in uh, the 2013 uh, recast, uh, this clause was deleted again from uh, the uh, current uh, reception condition directive. And then my final uh, uh, example uh, is uh, Article 22 of the UK Withdrawal Agreement, where um, the right of residents of uh, EU uh, nationals uh, or and UK nationals and their family members uh, may be restricted in accordance with national law where the conduct has occurred after the end of the transition period. This means that the protection that uh, the, which Nick Blake just illustrated that the public policy clause um, and, and the case law of the court uh, uh, grants to uh, union citizens and their family members uh, will uh, come to an end uh, after for conduct after uh, the, the December uh, of this uh, of this year. And with this clause, the uh, uh, the UK negotiators succeeded in in realizing an old wish uh, that they had expressed uh, the, the UK had already expressed for many years in the the, the council uh, the council of of ministers. Uh, but the result it will, it is that the uh, uh, EU nationals in the UK and British nationals in the EU 27 uh, will lose their protection of uh, community rights uh, in, in these cases. Uh, the, uh, and it might be uh, a good reason for uh, some of the British nationals uh, residing in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the EU 27 to either naturalize or to apply for the long-term uh, residence uh, uh, status, uh, which will give them, uh, again, uh, protection of e EU law uh, uh, against expulsion on uh, public uh, policy grounds. Next slides, please. Th that's a... Uh, I would like to end with a, with a personal note. Uh, when uh, the, the, the morning after the June 2016 uh, referendum, at the breakfast table, when we heard the news of the outcome of the referendum, uh, the first question my wife asked was, when will Britain return? Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, the answer of the questions will, there are three uh, relevant elements that, that no UK government uh, can change, whatever its political color. That's the geographical location of the UK and the, uh, uh, and the EU. I mean, we'll stay close together. Uh, that's the common, common history. Uh, the, uh, the history of, of uh, fighting wars uh, uh, against uh, close neighbors and with close neighbors. Uh, and inter interestingly, both Judge Shiman and Judge Forrester, the last UK judge uh, in the General Court uh, in, in Luxembourg, uh, were very aware of the EU as a guarantee uh, against human misery and, and the disruption of war. And the third element that, that no British government can change is the uh, size of the population and the size uh, of, of the, economy, uh, the economy, the relative size of the UK and uh, population and the EU's population. Re return probably will take a generation, uh, a lot of uh, political egos, uh, and it will create, the, the Brexit will create a lot of misery for uh, people with low incomes uh, at both sides of the of the channel, and to my view, the, the in my view, the uh, the question will not be will the, re 
the EU pay return one day, but will it return in its entirety or in shatters? And in the meantime, uh, the EU law will remain relevant for people, businesses and institutions in the UK. And most contributions of the UK lawyers to the EU and its law will continue to benefit. Uh, and uh, I thank you for that contribution and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting. No, normally with my panelists, I would start waving at them and telling them to be quiet. But I have to say, I enjoyed listening to you so much, I couldn't do it. So thank you for sharing with us the uh, both the positive and the negative contributions as well, which, um, which you highlighted as well. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Elspeth Gile, who is now going to look forward at the challenges uh, that we face that EU nationals uh, becoming third country nationals uh, and vice versa will face. So I'll hand over to Elspeth and then we will move on to the Q&A after her presentation. So please do send in your questions. Thank you very much, Nick. And it's a, a great honor and a very humbling experience to be speaking after two of the colleagues I have worked very closely with who have influenced me and taught me in terms of my knowledge about uh, immigration law and practice and the importance of law generally. And of course, it's a great pleasure to have Nick Rollison as the chair with whom I've worked for over 30 years um, in a, a, a wonderfully profitable relationship. Can I have my first slide, please? I'm going to talk about what it has meant to be a, a practitioner in the UK, a solicitor, and discovering EU free movement law. And I started practicing at the end of the 1980s. And of course we were very much dealing with national law, the immigration rules, the longest standing HC 169 for those of you who remember it and the complexity of it. And in a context of a number of cases which came to the office, we had to get to grips with EU free movement law. And I looked at it and I read it and I started reading the EEC treaty. And I discovered these words, freedom of movement for workers shall be secured within the union. And I asked everybody, well, what does that mean? Like, what do you have to do? I mean, you know, are there not a whole series of regulations and obligations and income requirements and good character requirements and one thing and the other? And in the UK, we were just trying to come to terms with this ourselves. And we were, it was just the, 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 the incredible clarity and simplicity of the statements of these rights, which took us completely by surprise. And we wanted to know what does this mean? So we had workers, then we had our establishment, our self-employed, which were going to be based on a prohibition of discrimination on the basis of nationality, and that took us to another whole place. We'd never had a prohibition on discrimination on the basis of nationality. What would this mean? And of course, we had our service providers, which um, Nick has mentioned too, is particularly important in Carpenter. And then finally, the decision in, in 1993 to create citizenship of the union is hereby established. I mean, this is such a grandiose statement. How do we turn this into reality? for people on the ground. Could I have the next slide, please? So what happened in the UK from a fairly early time onwards was that taking these grand statements of rights as if they were real law and law that could be applied, British lawyers began asking questions of their own judges and their own judges, just as surprised as I was when I dis discovered these rights, began asking questions to the Court of Justice and saying, well, what does this really mean? And so even just three, two years after the EU joined, there was the first case of Van Dyne about discrimination on the basis of nationality. I won't go into the details of it, but the court said basically, yes, this is an entitlement against which the state must present its arguments. Bouchereau on deportation, Cases raised that as well, because that's been a long-standing favorite of the UK, and we can see it coming back rapidly. Peak, which Nick has mentioned, which is 
actually no, you can't give leave to enter to EU nationals because they're entitled to enter. And I think it's important to stop there just for a moment because that idea was utterly revolutionary. In British immigration law in 1981, the idea that a non-national had a right to enter and that the state had to justify why it should be entitled to refuse that person was such an enormous reversal of all of our thinking as solicitors and barristers in the UK that it took us quite a long time to adjust to that. From a practical sense, the Savinci judgment, which wasn't a UK judgment, but a Dutch judgment about Turkish nationals, came to us just at the time that we as practitioners were dealing with quite a lot of Turkish asylum seekers from the events in Turkey in the end of the 1980s. And all of a sudden, there were rights which went even belong, beyond the nationals of the 12 member states as then was. On the, on the basis of third country agreements. And the idea for a British solicitor that a third country agreement, that an agreement with a third country by the EU could have legal effects for a Turkish national living in London, where a treaty that the UK had ratified with, for instance, Australia could not, was just an astonishing idea. It just changed the whole way we had to think about law. And then, of course, as Nick has mentioned, the Singh case, the end of the very punitive family reunification rule in the UK uh, on primary purpose, because EU uh, British citizens could go to another member state, enjoy family reunification and come back. And that was, I think, what really um, brought home to us the revolutionary nature of EU law. It could change even national law for British citizens at home and give, put them on a level playing field with EU nationals. Next slide, please. So we were really excited. So what did EU law do to us? Well, it, to some extent, I would say it transformed the legal profession, certainly in the field of immigration, because we were working in a world which Nick so clearly stated where, you know, Humpty Dumpty can say anything and doesn't have to have any reasons to refuse entry to someone at a border. And all of a sudden we had rules and we had real law. And we as immigration solicitors and barristers suddenly had a completely different role. Our job was not just to be nice to an administrator in the home office to try and get a good result for our client, it was to tell the administrator in the Home Office that his or her uh, decision was not in conformity with law. And it was real law, it was EU law, and it required implementation by all the whole of the British state, including the legal profession. And that, of course, had a very substantial impact as well on the Home Office, because it took case officers working in the Home Office quite a while to change their perspective from one of Lord Widgery, well, we can do anything we like, we don't like the smell of this application, to one where this is EU law, it is binding, and we must apply it correctly. And that transformed all of us and brought us really out of the world of administrative discretion and into the world of real law. Next slide, please. And so then, in the process of doing all of this, because you kept on saying, well, what is the purpose of this? We as, you know, uh, British solicitors, we're saying, well, I, okay, but what is this all about? What is this all for? And we discovered, as Nick mentioned, teleology, that laws are supposed to have purposes. Now, we know that there's a huge doctrine in Germany about the purpose of criminal law, which, you know, as massive tomes are written about. But we can see from the development of criminal law in the UK, that there's very little sense that criminal law has a purpose as such. It just kind of grows like topsy. In immigration law, we suddenly discovered that EU law has teleology and teleology is fixed. So if we look, for instance, at our latest Immigration Act, uh, we see that what is its purpose? The government has said for the first time in a generation, the UK will be able to decide who comes into the country based on the skills they have to offer not where they are from. Now that doesn't really tell you very much about what UK immigration is supposed to do. Who knows what skills people have? Who knows 
who wants them, who knows where they're coming from. How is this very general, rather um, uh, austere statement supposed to be transformed into law? And in EU law, we had this wonderfully clear idea. We're going for the ever closer union of the peoples of Europe. And that tells us as the lawyers, the administration in the home office, the judges, how are we supposed to understand uh, free movement of workers? Well, it's a part of a process of establishing this teleological objective. And the objective reveals how we are supposed to interpret these provisions. Can I have the next slide, please? So what does the objective do? And here I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. When you have an objective of a law, what characteristics does it reveal in EU free movement law? And the first thing is it provided an incredibly strong legal framework embedded in the treaties. And once something's embedded in the treaty, you can only change it when you amend the treaties. The member states don't like amending the treaties. It's a lot of trouble. It takes forever and everybody fights forever. So you have a, a framework which is very solid, not like the uh, immigration laws, but I'll come to that later. Secondly, it gives tremendous stability. We had a regulation from 1968 on free movement of workers. It didn't change until 2004. So we had a very solid and stable situation. And as we know, law works best where it has a strong legal framework and where it has stability. Law works best for everyone involved where you have a stable set of rules which continue to be applied and are only the objective of legal interpretation between very long periods uh, in which they're updated. We also had clarity. We knew what, what EU law was trying to do, and therefore the clarity of the, the objective enhanced predictability. You could talk to a client, you could take their details, you could say, okay, this is gonna work, that isn't gonna work, you can do this, you can't do that, these family members, etc. We had a legal framework, we had stability, and we had predictability. And for our clients as solicitors and barristers, what they want is predictability. They want to know, can I do this or can I not? The next thing was we had simplicity. There were strict limitations, for instance, on documentary evidence and their value. What did a worker have to do? The worker ha only had to prove that he or she had a contract and that could be done with a, a payslip. Uh, we had very clear rules on how you had to prove your identity. Well, did you have a passport or an ID card? And it doesn't matter if they're still valid. Simplicity made it wonderfully easy to explain to clients how to get the predictability and how to get the results they want. Then we had cost, free or at very low cost for the individual and the employer. And we had justiciability, a clear framework of appeal rights. We had no problems like we've had for ages about to what extent can work permit applications be appealed, what is um, legislated out of appeal rights, what's legislated in. As long as you were in EU law, you had an appeal right and you didn't have the whole problem on judicial review that your appeal right was limited to a point of law. The, um, the facts of the case were also relevant. Could I have the next slide please? So here I come back to what does an objective do Number two, in the characteristics of UK immigration law. And first, we have the problem of the, the very weak legal framework. Almost annually, since the uh, mid-1990s, we've had an Immigration Act or a Borders Act or an Immigration and Asylum Act. And that has weakened the legal framework by making it subject to constant revision. That's led to a higher degree of instability for practitioners, not just the changing of the Immigration Act, but also the changing of the rules, the changing of guidance. In our weekly meetings uh, in the office, the first thing everybody talks about is what words have changed in which set of guidance on which website of the Home Office, which is going to have a cataclysmic 
consequence. For some client I advised two weeks ago who's collecting documents on the basis of what was on the website last week, and now it's all different. And how am I going to explain that to my client? So the instability is horrific for us as practitioners, as solicitors, because we're supposed to be advising our clients about you can do this if you provide that. And if the rules are constantly being changed under you, you're endlessly having to tell your clients, well, maybe you can do it, or maybe they'll change the rules, and we have no idea if they're going to change the rules, etc., etc., etc. And that lead, leads us then to opacity. So we have a set of rules which are very unpredictable, and we, the solicitors and the barristers, are increasingly placed in the position where we're dependent on being very, very polite to our contacts in the home office, nurturing them, trying to find phone numbers, trying to find somebody kind who will perhaps explain to us how a rule or a bit of guidance might be applied next week when we're going to submit an application for a client. And we've seen since the referendum on Brexit, this importance of the role of uh, home office officials as little satraps in their fiefdoms has increased dramatically. And that, of course, has had a tremendous impact again on the independence of solicitors and barristers in the UK who are supposed to be applying law. But of course, the law is being rolled back into Lord Widgery's endless discretion without reasons. So then we had complexity and the changing criteria, even in Appendix EU, which is now the EU law, which has replaced the EU regulations for those EU nationals who are living in the, uh, in the UK and have rights under the withdrawal agreement, has become just a mountain of incredible complexity. You know, we read it every single week and some other bit has been stuffed in there and something else has come out. And already the clarity and simplicity of EU law has been uh, undermined and degraded. And of course, then we have the question of fees, both for individuals and employers, which are uh, very, very substantial. Can I have the last slide, please? So then the question is why? Why all of this? And here I think I'm going to leave you with, um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of Britain's favourite um, political scientists, Thomas Hobbes, on state sovereignty. What is state sovereignty? Well, if you take the divine out, then the state can do whatever it wants and is self-perpetuating and absolute. And of course, from Hobbes's perspective, this was extremely important because it was the only safeguard against civil war. But in terms of being an immigration practitioner, that exercise of state sovereignty uh, is extraordinarily complicated and makes the, um, the lives of the people we act for extremely difficult to manage. And we also have particularly, because Thomas Hobbes wasn't terribly interested in territory, uh, that wasn't his main focus, his main focus was the individual and sovereignty and the transfers of sovereignty. But John Agnew, who much more recently has been looking at globalization and sovereignty, and has been looking at how territory is in fact a trap. Thinking about the territorial borders is a trap which plays into ideas of state sovereignty and fails to take into account our world which is globalized. And I think we certainly see that now in the UK as solicitors and barristers and practitioners who are trying to deal with this opacity, which is based on this idea that somehow the UK is an island and everyone who enters needs to have a reason. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to you, Nick. Elspeth, thank you so much for that. I think that, that summarised um, my life in free movement as well, about how, you know, starting out as a law student and actually finding the, 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 this amazing world of rights-based immigration was, was really quite game-changing for me. Um, and, and for our practice as well, you know, working with you for, for so many decades that we, we, have, we have enjoyed. I, I, I was just going to make a comment really firstly on, the, on, on, um, on for, firstly on Casey's presentation, which was, which was excellent, thank you, and, and about the contribution of, of, uh, of uh, the UK to, um, <laughs> to, to 
to the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice, but also just to remember a, a, a moment when um, um, Elspeth and I had a case called El Yassini, um, uh, where um, we had had, you know, references, many references to the European Court of Justice, um, but they were always from the, the Court of Appeal or, you know, or, um, or the House of Lords um, after many, many years of delay. And um, in our case of El Yassini, which involved, a, a, it was a Moroccan case involving um, rights under the, under the Mor Morocco Agreement and uh, how they're in, interacted with, with residents and per work permits in the UK. A certain immigration adjudicator, Mr. Michael Shrimpton, who some of you on the call may, may know through his notoriety, <laughs> made a direct reference for the first time ever to Luxembourg and raised the question of what is a what is a court of law and what is the, what are the immigration courts? Well, thankfully, the immigration courts were recognised as a court of law. So we were very pleased about that. Um, and I thought, I think it brought the sort of all, whole world of UK immigration law really into the mainstream and, and, and empowered UK immigration adjudicators and later judges to actually take matters into their own hands and make decisions themselves without deferring necessarily to the higher courts. Um, obviously, later um, chief adjudicators and, uh, uh, and not, not the Nicholas Blake, but other presidents of the European, uh, of the immigration courts tried to squash that ability of the lower courts to refer cases to Luxembourg. Um, but you know, the, the, the ingenuity of British lawyers and uh, the kindness of British judges has enabled some cases to skip through uh, straight to Luxembourg um, without having to uh, without having to go through those very very long procedures. Um, I do also remember that adjudicator saying that he was he was referring the case to, to Luxembourg and looked forward to driving his Rolls Royce across to the continent. <laughs> um, so. Uh, that was just a comment really about that, that, that strange contribution. And I was very pleased that, that uh, Elspeth and I were the, f the first ever uh, lawyers to get a direct reference from the lowest court uh, to the European Court of Justice. And that was repeated in the case of Chen, which actually Nick wasn't one of our cases, sadly, but uh, I think but maybe you mentioned Bambas, which I don't think was our, was our case either, but um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions uh, from our panelists, um, and I, I, I just before I before I go into those, I wanted to ask Nick uh, Blake. Nick, you're you're sitting under a a very ominous looking weapon above your head behind you, which you may not have noticed, but I'm assuming that that is the sword of justice. Um, do you think that now that the rights that we have been accustomed to over these last 47 years? Um, are ending and being extinguished, although we have some limited rights remaining for UK nationals and EU nationals in the UK. Um, do you think that UK immigration lawyers are going to have to unsheathe their swords for the fight ahead in administrative law and immigration law? Uh. I'm not sure I can entirely answer that without getting into um, uh, material which goes beyond uh, my competence. But you're you're wrong. In fact, the sword is not the sword of justice. It's a, a Sikh kirpan, but um, <clears throat> it may well have that meaning in uh, Punjabi culture. Um, uh, I, I think uh, the future of immigration outside the EU will be a fresh challenge for a fresh generation. And um, I wish that generation well to make some sense out of the directions that are going. Um, I, frankly, I'm not sure that Lord Justice Widgery was entirely right, even in 1969. Um, uh, but uh, these days, at least policies, we know the once they exist, uh, will be the subject of uh, judicial deliberation. Um, and we do also, at the moment, have the European Convention on Human Rights, even though I think uh, domestic interpretation is somewhat over-deferential to the executive on some issues. But um, all these can be changed. There's a review about the uh, scope of the Human Rights Act in the immigration context about to begin. 
And we know that if the executive doesn't like a judicial decision on a policy, it can simply change it. That's the prerogative of the executive outside a, a law-based uh, regime. Uh, we even know from the present uh, government's view of international law that it's something that can be derogated from in the case of um, um, good imperative reasons. See the proposed um, uh, derogations from the treaties agreed only a year ago in the Internal Markets Bill, although we understand that that is now not going to go forward. Uh, that is a, some, an indication of where at least the present administration thinks the UK's uh, relationship to international law lies. I think these are all very challenging issues, but I fear they go into the sphere of the political rather than the description of, of what we know today. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I, I would also add to that probably the, 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 the current review of judicial review um, and the potential proposal to bring that into some sort of statutory framework rather than the common law, which is also, I think, a big concern for, for us lawyers. Um, uh, you know, when we're thinking about widgery and the uh, right uh, and the power of the state to make arbitrary decisions, the judicial review could potentially be undermined and become the creature of parliament um, more than it is of the common law, which could be a, a real problem. Um, so yes, um, we have a, a question from the panel, and this is one probably, I think for Elspeth, um, for, the, for the panel, which is to do with uh, a young uh, person who's studying uh, to be a lawyer and wondering um, how, they, how they can do so and how they can uh, become a lawyer dealing with EU law um, um, in the context of being a UK student. Elspeth, do you have anything to say about that apart from encouraging them to come to Nijmegen? Well, I think um, it's now very difficult um, to think of a career as a, uh, an English solicitor or barrister uh, practicing in free movement of persons law. Uh, you will be very busy probably for the next 20 years as we work our way through the um, withdrawal agreement protections and Appendix EU and the various unsatisfactory way, uh, issues which are already arising in respect of the way in which the Home Office is applying uh, EU rights. But you will be on the dying end of, um, of a period. I think that... Um, we will, EU law will remain particularly important to the UK, but it will be a completely different part of EU law, which I think most British solicitors have yet to get their heads around, which is EU law, immigration law. So it'll be the long-term residence directive, it'll be the family reunification directive, it'll be EU law, which applies to third country nationals, blue card, etc. And it's going to be quite difficult for British nationals to think of themselves as somehow subject to exactly the same rules as Russians, Chinese, Americans, etc., in the EU. That will also be uh, particularly problematic for students wanting to study uh, in the EU. So there will be this tremendous change. Uh, we're already at, in the, in the law school, talking about whether or not EU law will remain a mandatory subject on the LLB course. And I think law schools across the whole of the UK are worrying about this. My best example or uh, that I think the UK should follow is to have a look at Switzerland, where they take EU law very seriously in all its contexts, because for all of the reasons which Case put forward, British lawyers are going to need to know about EU law because there are three main characteristics that even the most xenophobic British government will never be able to change about our relationship with Europe. Thank you, Elspeth. Um, we have a question um, from Gillian Moore of the European Commission, who uh, I'm not sure if you've seen her on the Q&A, uh, about the Siren Singh judgment. And she asks whether the withdrawal agreement, which sadly doesn't protect the right of e-nationals returning to the UK after having worked and live in, in an EU member state to bring their family members back with them, 
we have unilateral concessions from the U UK, which go to the end of March 2022. And the question is what rights for those of us Brits who may return to the UK with our non-EU family members after that date? I'm not sure if anybody has any comments on that question, which I think is very interesting about these sort of vestigial rights that are being um, very kindly extended, but how far will they go? Um, I'm not sure whether Case or Elspeth or Nick has anything to, to say on that. I was just going to say, um, there's going to be, there'll be the income requirements. And I would say that Brits in those situations should remember that Ireland is a lovely country. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have some other technical questions, uh, which I don't think we can answer, which are very, very specific. Um, but one of the, um, one of the, the, the questions that um, I think maybe we, we should look at, I think Case, um, do you think that you, you will miss the influence that you talked about? Um, or, or you'll be happy to see the back of it <laughs> because of particularly the, that some of the negative aspects that the UK has fought for in some of the cases like uh, like Ackrich on abuse of rights and, and embedded into EU law in some of those those key cases on on family members and and uh, you know particularly Irish nationals in the UK. Um, do you have any comments on that? Uh, yes, Nick. Uh, um, I, I I think part of the, the 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 British case law, of course, it was was a reaction to the the restrictive reception of EU law. Uh, and, uh, as, it, as, as EU law has been, the free movement law has been received in all member states uh, by immigration authorities as, 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 as a basic and, and unheard word of change uh, uh, and, and loss of discretion and power. Uh, so there was a negative uh, influence every, uh, anywhere. And I think UK was exceptional uh, in having a, a, a bar uh, and and uh, both bar bar barristers and lawyers and, and solicitors who uh, yeah use their creativity to fight for the the the, the, the full realization of uh, free movement rights far more than in in, in many other countries. I mean, uh, one quarter of all the cases under the 2438 uh, free movement directive are from Britain. I mean. It's not a quarter of the population of the EU that is living in 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 Britain. So so I um, uh, uh, I, I, th I think we'll we'll really miss the the contribution. If you if you look to the contribution of of uh, British scholars to the development of of free movement law and also of the the new migration and and asylum law, uh, uh, I, I I think we'll 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 really miss it. And I th I saw in the in the chat somebody. Who uh, uh, participants who remarked that um, there's no nothing like the air center uh, anywhere else in Europe, and of course the air center is unique. But uh, don't forget that 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 it has been a model that uh, is is transformed uh, within the, the the legal culture of different member states in 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 different ways. If you you uh, a very recent. Uh, uh, Reference to the court in Luxembourg on, on equal treatment um, uh, is uh, raised by uh, AGI, uh, a, a, an organization of, of uh, Italian immigration lawyers and immigration ac academics. Who, I mean, I mean I, I, they surely know uh, and have seen the example of, of the, the Air Center and try to, to model it uh, uh, in, in their own system. So, don't underestimate the influence. Yes, thank you, Case. And, and I, I, I was going to give a shout out to the Air Centre for the amazing work that they've done, and Nuala Moll there, who has been a great supporter and advocate of, uh, of free movement in the UK. But, but as Nuala said, and probably this is potentially going to be our closing remarks as we, we bring this webinar to a close, is that Nuala said to me when I sent her the invitation, um, well, free movement is only ending for you guys. There's still 27 other countries that have free movement, you know, and it's alive and kicking and there's lots of fights to be had and lots of battles that we have uh, ahead. And um, sadly, us in, 
uh, us lawyers in the UK will most likely not be a huge part of that anymore. We hope that we can contribute something to you, support you in your in your battles ahead, um, and continuing the fight for uh, migrant rights, uh, third country national rights, and the rights of EU nationals for themselves. Um, and I have to say that I close this webinar with a very heavy heart, knowing that in a few weeks' time, my rights as an EU national will be extinguished. Um, and I have to say that it's a very emotional time for me, and I'm sure for many of you still on the panel and still on, on, the, on the webinar, that we know that uh, this is all coming to an end. So with that rather depressing thought, um, I will close this webinar and thank our, our great speakers. Um, they've been fantastic and it's just been such a pleasure to hear you, to hear your thoughts, but also to work with you for so many years um, and, and to see you regularly and to hear your insights and thoughts um, and share your, your views um, and you'll get your advice at all these times. So thank you for all your help and over the years. And thank you to all of our, our participants for joining. Wish you a very good uh, rest of the day, a, a very happy holiday season, and uh, a very sad farewell to free movement, finally. Thank you. Bye-bye.